some years ago, I wanted to know how bees fly, and I always I used to look for lectures on bee flight, and I never found one. So after some years of searching, I thought, oh, bugger this. So I got the books, and I did the research, and I watched a load of videos, and, um, and, I, and, I, and I read a load of academic papers, and I've learned, therefore, the basics of how bees fly. And I say the basics because it's frightfully complex, and we could do a whole weekend on honeybee flight. So I hope, by, I mean, one of my um, old Dublin beekeeper colleagues used to say that uh, there's two sorts of lectures you can go to. There's the ones that make you a better beekeeper, and there's the ones that don't. And this is one of the ones that doesn't, right? It's not going to help you get more honey. Um, but it's kind of fun, and I think it's a fascinating topic. Um, and as John says, there's, there is something very interesting about how bees fly. So you'll understand the bee's flight equipment by the end of this and the principles of flight and the mechanics of how a bee flies. Um, so I think we'll start by looking at how, how bees fly in the first place. How they fly, uh, sorry, why fly? Because flying requires you to evolve a whole bunch of specialized equipment and it apply, requires a lot of compromises in terms of your weight and your size. Um, and repurposing limbs to do other things and that sort of thing. Um, so flying is expensive in that evolutionary sense. But the upside is you can see the world in three dimensions. And if you're an ant, which we, I guess our bees would be if they weren't bees, if they didn't fly, um, you can, you, you've got a very limited view of the world. But if you, if you can fly 10 foot up, you can understand so much more about your environment. Secondly, you can travel much faster. Um, if you imagine the, the, the speed, the, the, if you imagine um, proportionately to the your length of your body, a fruit fly travels 10 times faster than a racehorse. And even without adjusting for body length, a duck can fly as fast as a racehorse, but it can do it all day faster than these fellas out here, the, who can only do it for two or three minutes. And so there's a huge advantages. And of course, you can overcome obstacles, obstacles like the Menai Strait, or, um, or mountain ranges, walls, road, motorways, that sort of thing you can get over safely. And so you can move around, you can, you can, you can mate, you can find uh, mating partners in other parts of the world. I'm married to a woman from another country. Um, you can, and insects, animals can survive climate change better because they can move further, because they can escape their environment more easily. So there's a lot of advantages to flying. So let's see how this insect manages to lift its 130 milligrams of weight into the air. And I think we'll start then. We'll start. Incidentally, the first ever air accident investigation on record involved beekeeping hive products, which of course was Icarus and his pal Daedalus, who an Icarus went and flew, and, his, and the beeswax got the blame. More like a silly Greek fella to, to, taking uh, too much of a chances. Now, your problem with your wings is your wings have got to be as big as they can to fly but they've got to be as small as possible when you're inside in the house. And the way that aircraft solve this problem, the way that chickens, now chickens, chickens have got elbows. If you had chicken wings for lunch or you're going to have them for dinner, you'll know that they've got elbows because they do this, right? You, chicken wings, when you buy them, they're always, they're always curled up. And so they can, they, to get into a small space, they bend up their, 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 their wings. Um, and all, all birds can do that. Um, but bees haven't got elbows, have they? At least not on their wings. They've got elbows. They've got knees, obviously, on their legs, but they haven't got elbows. Um, and so they can't do that. So aircraft can do this. This is, this is an aircraft going into an aircraft carrier. And they, they have all sorts of mechanical things for doing that, but bees can't do that. So what bees do, of course, is bees have got four wings. But in practice, they've only got two. Because what they do... Um, and as I'm sure you know, when they're in the hive, they wrap them, they, they stack them very elegantly, one, two, three, four, on top of each other like this. And when they're in the open, and you can see this one here, it's slightly blurred. It is blurred and big because it's moving. But this bee is, 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 has um, displayed its Nazanoff gland, is giving off the home scent, and it's fanning. And you can see the wings out there. And these wings are sort of half out, and you can see halfway there. So bees... Bees have effectively a wing each side when they're in flight because the front wing and the back wing are connected. Unlike, say, dragonflies, where they have four wings as well, but they, they flap independently. And dragonflies have a very sophisticated way of flying. And that's why they can, they can do all this clever turning and backwards and all kinds of stuff. So um, 
bees are of the, of the order that bees are a uh, member of is the hymenoptera, um, membrane wings. Um, and that's that, um, they're made of cuticles, stiffened, just like butterfly wings. You remember the butterflies, when they first come out, their wings are very soft and they have to dry them in the sun. Well, likewise, bees, they're stiffened by the veins on the wings. Um, and they dry over a couple of hours. Now, who's got a rev counter on their car? Right, would you like to tell me how, how far it goes up to? Uh, about 6,000. About 6,000, okay. And how, how, how hard have you, how, how, how far? You would get up to about 4,000 or 3,000, something like that. Okay, so wings beat at 200 or 250 times a second. And 200 times a second, let's be conservative, is 12,000. So instead of you running your car at 4,000, and you might take it up to 6,000 if you want to be a boy racer for a, for a little while, they're running it at 12,000 whenever they're out. Um, and this doesn't go in for an annual service and you can change parts. This is it, right? This is, you know, this is it. This is all they've got. And so it's an incredible piece of engineering. Let's have a look at the parts in turn. These are the wing. This is a drone's wing from uh, Dr. Goodman's book, uh, Form and Function. And a couple of things to note. Um, so the, the fore wing and the hind wing, you will see little hooks here. They're called hamuli. And there's a vein, there's a, there's a, there's a little, almost like guttering here, a little V. And the hooks fit into the, this guttering. And that's why, and, oh, in flight, and it, they act like one wing. And all the, all the muscle power is on the front wing, just about. You can see the veins there, all sorts of different veins. Some of them, and they're, they're, some of them carry nerves as well, which is why they, sometimes some people think it's cruel to clip a, a queen's wings. Um, and you can see the front wing and the back wing, a whole bunch of joints here. And all of this is moving at 200 times a second, um, 250 times a second, which is why it's so hard to take pictures of bees, uh, bees wings in flight. Um, it really takes, takes a lot of effort there. Um, so you can also see dotted lines here. You know how when a sail, when a sailing ship, this, this sail is full of wind on a ship, it's bent. This way, it curves. Well, the bee's wing fold. There's one fold there, and there's the other one there. And they sort of bend around that shape. So they flex a little bit. Um, so that's the wing itself. And that, so how do they get them back in a hive? Well, um, with some kind of origami, as, uh, as Harry Dade, Harry Dade is uh, his wonderful book, Anatomy and Dissection of the Honeybee, he says, you take the wing, take a piece of paper, bend it over halfway, and bend it over a quarter. So you sort of go back this way, and then, I can't do it with my arms. Even if I was double jointed, I couldn't do it. But it's an, and then, remember, this is a piece of equipment that's moving 250 times a second. And they have this very complicated thing to fold it back to fit inside the nest. So they can go in through a small entrance and keep cuddled up close together. So you have the wings. And the next thing, of course, is that every aircraft needs an engine, and it needs fuel, and it needs some sort of control surface, some sort of brain to drive it. And of course, um, all of these, anything that flies needs these, needs these kind of things. Um, so bee muscles, bees' flight muscles, are the same kind of stuff as bird muscles and our muscles. Very straightforward, very equally powerful. The hemolip, so bees don't have blood as such, as you probably know. Our blood has two functions, two main functions. One is to bring um, uh, oxygen from my lungs to my muscles so that I can do this and you can keep breathing. Um, and also sugar from my stomach here where I've just, did, I'm digesting my sausage and mash to my muscles to allow me to do that sort of thing. Bees are very small and they're um, their air doesn't go into lungs and then through the blood. It gets piped directly to the muscles. And if you're very small, you can do that. And that's why they breathe through holes in the sides of their bodies here. And so that's why their blood isn't red, because it isn't carrying oxygen. It's only carrying food. And typically, it'll be about 2% sugar. And at 2% sugar, they can fly perfectly well. At 1%, the mixture is too lean and it can't fly. And they can't fly. So it's like driving, trying to drive a car with rubbish petrol. Yeah? Um, she flies at about 15 miles an hour, it's 25 kilometers an hour, and she can fly faster, maybe at um, 25 miles an hour for short distances. Um, and she uses about 10 milligrams of fuel uh, an hour. So on a full stomach, she can fly for about 15 minutes, four or five miles. Now she won't typically, when you'll only fly, fly as far as they have to. 
Um, and of course, air goes in the sides and exhaust gases, CO2, come out. And those of you that will remember, some of you might remember this from school, this is the, this is the formula. Um, so this is, this, is your, this is your glucose here. This is your sugar. And the oxygen goes in. And of course, out comes CO2, water, and energy. And it's absolutely, it's the reverse, of course, of photosynthesis, isn't it? Where you, where you really absorb CO2 and water from the environment and sunlight and turn it into stored sugars, which is how we get our, get our food. Um, and of course, and just like you are, most of you, unless you've just come rushing up the stairs, aren't panting now, you're just gently breathing. Bees, you don't see breathe, bees breathing heavily, normally. In fact, tidal air, it'll just naturally go in and out without them even breathing. Um, uh, is enough for them when they're at rest. But if you look at this lady here, you can see her breathing there. Can you see that? She's, sorry, it's her, oh, she's gone. And she might come back. There she is, breathing. Her. So she's, her, her oxygen levels are depleted, just like me if I ran up and down here. Um, and then she has to breathe heavily to, 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 get more, to get more oxygen, to change the air and get the CO2 out. It'd be interesting to calculate the carbon footprint of a bee, but at least it's needless to say it'll be very small, I'm sure. Um, now, when I move my arm here, um, by the way, if you're at the back it would um, and you want to see better this physical stuff that I'm doing, you, you, it might be wise to come to the front, up to you, um, or come a little bit forward. Um, if I, when I move my muscles like this, my bicep is attached to my arm and it pulls my arm up directly. These are directly attached muscles, yeah? And so, that, and that's what happens. And the bird's wings, you've got the chicken breast here, and the chicken flaps its wings, or the duck or whatever it is, and it takes off in that way. Um, bees' muscles are different. They do have direct, they're direct muscles, that is to say muscles that are directly attached to the wings, but they're typically only used for changing the direction of the wing, for trimming the flight, for, for turning, and that sort of thing. The bees... Um, use indirect flight muscles. And this takes a bit of explaining, so I'm going to go through this. So indirect muscles, if we look at the thorax, which roughly corresponds to the chest of a bee, you will see the, the turgal and sternal plates, so that, if you like, is the front, or the, the bit nearest the ground, and the bit nearest the back. Um, these two plates. You will notice that where, where the wing is attached, is right at the end of the top one, but not right at the end of the lower one. And this is really important. Um, there's also a set of muscles. The muscles go up and down. These ones go dorsoventral, from the ventris to the dorsal, you know, from the back to the front, front to the back. And longitudinal ones that run the length of the thorax. And as you can see here, this is where the, where the wing is attached in different places, one at the end and one not at the end. If you were to squeeze the bee's thorax up like this, to, make, to pull it up like that, that's going to push the wing down because of the way that it's attached in different places. And if, likewise, if you squeeze the wing, the, the thorax down, you pop the wings up. And that's what happens. And so these muscles here serve to drive the thorax up and down, or drive the, the gap close na to narrow, to widen and narrow the gap from the ventris dorsal bit to the ventral bit, the back to the front, and, they, and it does this, which in turn flaps the wings. So it isn't like our direct muscles, it's indirect. So, and what you can see here is as you push them apart, the wing goes down, and as you push them together, the wing goes up. Now we're gonna see a little animation, which I hope is gonna work, Hooray! And what you can see here is if you look at just, just the muscles, the C muscles, the light brown ones going from the dorsal ventral muscles, those are being squeezed down now and that's popping the wing up. And they're letting go, and they're squeezing down now and that's popping the wing up. So what's pushing the wing, what's pushing in the other way? Well, the other muscles, the D, the darker ones, are the dorsoventral ones that run from, the, if you like, the neck to the, from the, the head to the abdomen, those ones are being squeezed, which is, which is pulling the, uh, the, the thorax in the other direction. 200 times a second. Now, our brains tell us to do things like... Um, tell us, my brain is telling my mouth to speak and your brain is telling your, your lips to breathe and that sort of thing. Um, 
And that's what we do all the time. Um, and because we have ner brain, nerves from the brain down the spinal column or wherever to our fingers, that can tell our fingers to do this or to write in our notebook or check our phone or whatever we're doing. If you're doing that 250 times a second, the electronics don't work anymore because you're sending the signals so fast it doesn't work. So neurogenic control, where the brain controls the, the body, doesn't, the nerves, the muscles, doesn't work anymore. So they, they've evolved a different thing, which is what the instruction comes down and says, start flapping and keep flapping until I tell you to stop. That's called myogenic control. It's completely different to the way we do things. We, can't, we humans can't do this. And as a, result, they, as a result, they can say, right, keep flapping, and they keep flapping 200 times a second, 12,000 times a minute. Um, so that's how the wings are driven. And then, of course, they use indirect flight muscles to trim the flight, to change the angle so they turn, so they go backwards, so they go forwards, and that sort of thing. And we'll have a look at that in a bit more detail. I want to talk about now the... The how the bee learns about things. So bees, as you know, how many eyes has a bee got? Five. Five, exactly. Um, they, they don't have stereo vision, so they can't tell where I can tell how far away this gets. You know that thing in Father Ted? Small, far away, you know? Um, <laughs> so uh, if you, uh, they, bees can't tell. It's like being, having just one eye, if you like. They don't have the stereoscopic vision. So they can't tell how far away something is, which is one of the things we do when we're, when we're finding out how fast we're going. We use stereoscopic, stereoscopic vision. They don't have that, so they use, they use something else. Our eyes, um, they do a couple of other things. Our eyes, you know when you go to the movies, the movies, in the, certainly it's now digital and everything and such like, but it used to be a strip of celluloid with different pictures on it, didn't it? And that, they were flashed on the screen 50 times a second, right? 50 hertz, and a 50 hertz TV. Now, that's because if um, the human eye, if it sees things really fast, it just blur, they just blur into one. And in fact, so you're looking at this, 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 um, this old movie of a horse galloping or, a, or, a, or a, a woman picking up a saucepan to hit somebody with or something, and, 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 you, and it's a set of stills. But our human body, our human eye sees them, sees them more than 35 times a second, and it blurs. And the flicker fusion rate, the rate at which flickers become fused into one, is 35 times a second for us. And so um, um, if you see a cricket ball go past your nose, you don't see the ball, you see a blur. Because by the time your eye has seen it, it's gone. And there's another image, another image. You just see this brown blur as it goes past. Honeybees' flicker fusion rate is 150 times a second, nearly four times faster. So honeybees, if you took a honeybee to the movies, the honeybee would go, why are we watching all these photographs? They're nearly all the same. You know, like when you, because they'd be like, well, they wouldn't. Let's not anthropomorphize them too much. They wouldn't be interested in westerns. They'd probably want to watch something else. But <laughs> honeybees, and so their, their eyes are completely different. Um, they, they measure... Well, I'll talk about how, how, they, how they measure later. They, use the, they have the three oculi, the, the three uh, eyes on the top of their head that can't really focus and all they can tell is light and dark. Apparently, they use those like an artificial horizon. Driving along, they can tell. Um, they, they, so if, if, if you're flying straight and level, then, you're, then, then your oculi are facing the, sea, facing the sky and it's nice and bright. If you tip over to one side, obviously the oculus at this side goes darker. And that tells the bee to straighten up and fly right. And up he comes. Apparently, that's what they do. Um, so it is said. Um, the way they measure airspeed. Now, the way we need to measure speed is just over the ground, because we're using our feet to propel ourselves. But the bee needs to know two things, like anybody flying an aircraft does, airspeed and, and, and speed over the ground. Because airspeed, you could be flying at 20 mile an hour into a 30 mile an hour wind and going backwards. It's important to know both these things. The way they measure um, uh, speed over the ground is by optic flow, how fast things are going past. There's this chap in Australia, Srinivasan, who's done uh, research on, on bees, on, on vision and many other things, but particularly vision. Um, and he got bees flying through a tube which had like a zebra crossing, you know, black and white stripes. 
Um, and he had them flying through that. And then what it was, he put the tube, the, 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 tube, the, the stripes were on a conveyor belt. <laughs> so, so he switched the conveyor belt on and, the, and the, the stripes started to move faster and faster. And the bees thought, the bees thought they were flying slower and slower, so they were speeding up to drive fast as fast as they could. And then he had them flying backwards and stuff. So by which time he proved that it was the optic flow of the, the, fa the speed at which the stuff moves over the ground that tells them their ground speed. Because they need them both to, to, to calculate how far away something is and how, much, how to get there. Uh, when you were a kid, you would cycle down a hill, and you, those of us that have hair, we might uh, vaguely remember it, some of us just vaguely remember it, your hair would be pushed back like this, and you'd feel it in your eyes. And that sense of speed, that's, broadly speaking, how they, how they measure speed over the, through the air is, is they use the, and the elbow and the, in the antennae, that's called the organ of Johnston here. This is it here. And the more it's bent back, the faster they're going. Right? Uh, through the air, not over the ground, through the air. Um, uh, this is, again, from Dr. Goodman's gorgeous book. Um, apparently, apparently, they, um, an optic flow, incidentally, the, um, the, the US Defense DARPA, the US Defense Research um, um, uh, body that um, basically um, does a lot of science is trying to use optic flow because they're de designing micro, mi very small drones to go in for warfare. Some very um, scary research going on in those, those areas at the moment. Apparently, bees, when they're flying, have a, some of them have a preference for left or right. Half of them have a preference and half of them don't. And those that do, they apparently have more or less half and half. I think we need to do more research on that. My favorite, um, my favorite of all. Uh, parts of this whole lecture, I suppose, um, and my, the thing, probably the thing that most impresses me about the bees is the bees in uh, 19, I'll tell you when it was, 1984, it was actually a space shuttle, I think it was Challenger, 84, the space program was getting a bit boring and the American people weren't so engaged and therefore the NASA thought they weren't going to get, you know, their, their budget was going to be cut. So they went to schools and say, could you think of science experiments to do in space? And some, a student called Dan Poscovich in Tennessee, I think, wrote in and said, can bees make, build comb in space, you know, without gravity? Uh, never mind space, but in zero gravity. And so they sent up the, um, these, these bees. This is a, an observation hive, uh, the bee enclosure module. <laughs> they left one on the ground in Cape Canaveral, uh, which died. <laughs> rocket scientists may be clever, but they can't keep bees. Um, apologies to any rocket scientists in the room. Um, but they left one on the ground and the bees died. Um, they, they sent the other one up into space on the Challenger. So, um, as you can see, there's some, co there's, some, there's some frames here, which presumably the bees are living on. There's food here. And there's some electrics for a fan and a heater here or whatever. Um, and there was a little space here. Now, the bees did learn to, fly, learn, learn to build comb. They, they didn't really know where to start, but once they got going, in zero gravity. Once they got going, oh, well, we may as well build it here, soon as, you know, why not? So, um, but, and I'm going to read this to you um, in, the, in the log, and you can look this up. Um, the crew noted in the log that by day seven, comb was well developed. Bees seem to adapt to zero gravity pretty well. No longer flying, trying to fly against the top of the box. Many were actually flying from place to place. So the bees had learned to fly in zero gravity. Isn't that astonishing? That's incredible. I, I, yeah, yeah, incredible. Unfortunately, there's no video footage of that. They didn't do much. Uh, how they navigate is in a whole lecture in itself. I have a lecture on, 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 on honeybee orientation and communication. Von Frisch learned they used the sun. Of course, that's von Frisch's famous lecture, The Dance Language of Honeybees, where he, you know, he got the Nobel Prize for it. Um, they navigate with the sun, um, and they calculate as the sun moves. They, you know, the bee, the, the bee that's dancing calculates the sun has moved, and therefore I need to change my dance, otherwise they won't find the honey, and they, they change the dance around and that sort of thing. Um, they navigate by the sun. They also navigate by landmarks. While the rest of Europe was slaughtering itself, um, von Frisch managed to avoid, uh, avoid getting conscripted in two wars. Quite impressive, really. But um, he, was, he did... He did a lot of experiments. He, got, he did some fantastic experiments, so one of which is he got bees, trained them to a food source by a forest fence. So it, they're in a, in a field, and there's a line of trees. And he, so um, he trained them to the food source. And then what he would do, and, and the line of trees was running north-south. And then he'd come up in the middle of the night and move the bees 
to another field that looked exactly the same, except the trees were running east-west. The question is, do they find the food? Because if they find the food, they're orienting against the forest fence. And if, then, if they don't find it, they're orienting against the sun. He found that when they be very close to the, to the forest, they use the landmark. To the landmark, they use it. And when they're further away, they use the sun. I had bees by a shed once. And you know, when you've emptied a shed, you know, it'll come down in, in 10 minutes once you pull a few nails out. It just comes to like the house of cards. And I had these bees flying around going, where's the bloody shed gone? You know, it was sure. You know, and in the end, so I found it in the end. But clearly, the landmark, without the landmark, they, were, they, had, they had serious trouble finding it. Um, Somewhat amusing for a while. Um, there's a little bit of evidence that bees use. Uh, so we in our brain have a hippocampus. I know that's the, means the horse, horse racing field for some, or something, doesn't it? It's the racetrack, a hippocampus out there. Um, um, and that's, we build a cognitive map. So it, when you came in this morning, particularly if it was your first time, you learned there, OK, that way's that way. So if I go around that way, so that way's that way. And you build a map in your head. Bees don't have a hippocampus, because their bee is, oh, tiny. Um, but there is some evidence, and there's a big debate going on um, at the moment, about whether bees can do this cognitive mapping. Certainly, they're able to learn a whole lot of stuff. Um, now, here's an interesting question that, that is being debated at the moment. How do swarms navigate? So you know what happens. You've got a whole bunch of swarms hanging around on a, in, a, you know, in, the, in the transit lounge. And there's a nice site over there, and the, the scouts have convinced them, the, the, the scouts decide, OK, we're going to move. And they all lift off. How do all the other bees know? And so the, the, the current hypothesis, which currently been, let me see, what's it called? I'm trying to remember myself. It's the, the vision hypothesis, is that the scout bees fly through this cloud of bees at great speed and then teach them. And they've, they've, they've tested this by getting bees from another colony to fly through the fly through this, the cloud of bees in the wrong direction and see if it messes up the, the bees' ability to follow the scouts. And yes, it does. So there's, but there's, there's more to be learned there for sure. In fact, there's a lot more to be learned about this sort of thing. I should mention a little bit about neonicotinoids neo as well. It does seem that they, in uh, non-lethal, but uh, in the lab anyway, not necessarily in the lab, and concentrations you get in the, um, that you administered artificially, uh, they interfere with memory. So here's, a, here's a, a graph of the experiment. So you release the bees here. They should find their way back to the hive. And what happened, because, because of the landmark, they follow the, the ditch along here. But what happens is the ones that are dosed up gets awfully lost and so on. They were doing radar stuff on bees. Now, the issue with neonics, and I really don't want to get into the politics of it, but the issue with neonics is, is that a heavy, heavy enough doses that you would actually find in the field? Or is this just, because clearly doses tend to be higher in the lab when they're administered artificially. I don't know. I think there's more research needs to be done on it. So that's, that's if you like, that's the anatomy side of this lecture. Now let's talk a little bit about flight. So. Um, We've talked about why you fly. Let's talk about some of the principles of flight then. And I suppose we'll start with this one. Uh, we'll start with this thing here. As I'm sure you're absolutely sick as beekeepers of being told that bees can't bloody fly. And there is a, there is a particular brand of fundamentalist Christian that says, that uses this as an argument, say, well, not everything can be explained by science and therefore, you know, other things. Um, Yes, they can. Yes, of course they can bloody fly. Don't be so stupid. Um, the, the source of this appears to be a French guy called Antoine Magnon, who, was, who wrote a book called Insect Flight. Right? He wrote a book about insect flying. And in the preface, he said, I'll read this. He said, and I quote specifically, first of all, pushed by what we've seen in aviation, I have applied to insects the laws of air resistance. And I have come with my assistant, Saint Laguet. Uh, Saint Laguet was the mathematician. He was the brains of the operation. Um, with my assistant, Saint Laguet, to this conclusion that their flight is impossible. So it's a book about insect flight. He clearly didn't mean it, for God's sake. <laughs> he, he was, and this is exactly what, you know, a clickbait. This is the 1930s equivalent of clickbait, right? And very successful, more successful than, I mean, you can't find his book, it's out of print. But certainly this, this quote has outlived him completely. Um, and it's all insects, and it's not just bumblebees. The point is this. When, when, when they started 
um, with the Wright brothers and powered flight. And people started building mathematical models of how birds fly. So it's fairly straightforward. You have a wing area of this big, and you have a mass of this big, and you have a rate of flapping of this much. Then you build a mathematical model that says, well, this is where the lift comes from at this speed and so on and so forth. You build a mathematical model for aircraft and birds, and you can explain how they fly. And you can predict how well they fly or they don't. Right? Very straightforward. However, if you apply these rules to insects, they do not explain how insects fly. You need to understand more, and because there's cleverer stuff that they hadn't figured out in 1934. That's where he's going with this, right? <sighs> Right, so bees can't fly. Yes, they bloody can. Right, so let's look at the forces. These are the forces that apply, that are associated with flight. Firstly, we have weight, which is what's keeping you stuck to the floor. I will demonstrate weight like this. Weight, weight is gravity, is the pull of the Earth on us. It would be less if we were on the moon, clearly, and you've seen those movies the, the, of, of a, a, Apollo astronauts. So you need an upward force to counteract that. And if you're a rocket, it's the, you know, the engine at the bottom. You want to go somewhere, typically, so you need thrust, something to push you forward. And you have drag, which is the thing. Let me, if you go to swimming pool, because swimming is moving in a fluid, just like flight is. If you go to swimming pool, right, and you go to the edge, right, and you push yourself off from the edge, but you don't swim, you just, you just keep yourself straight like this, you will slow down after about, what, 20 meters, 10, depending on, yeah. It's drag. There's two sorts of drag, incidentally. There's pressure drag, which is the, the, the more aerodynamic you are, the, you know, the, if you're a square box, you'll slow down faster than if you're a needle. Because you, you know, there's less push to push against. You're, sort of, you know, you're pushing the air to one side, the water to one side. And there's a friction drag, which is where basically the stickiness of your body and the stickiness of the air, which is why professional um, cyclists and uh, swimmers shave their legs, shave every part of themselves, because they're smoother through the air. The hairier you are, the stickier you are, the, the more, you'll, more drag you'll get from that. But anyway, we won't worry about that too much. Um, so there are different sorts of flight. There is parachuting, or, which is what uh, dandelions do and, and parachutists do. That's called falling slowly, essentially. Um, and there's no clever flight to that. You're simply trying to slow down your, uh, dr have lots of friction, dra lots of drag, right, in your, in your little uh, canopy, which slows you down so that when you hit the ground, firstly, you don't kill yourself um, if you're a parachutist. But if you are a uh, dandelion, hopefully you've been blown by the wind some distance. Um, then there's gliding. Gliding, if you can see, these are, um, these are little helicopters from uh, and you can see, in a bit of wind, they will take you some distance if they come off a tree. And the nicer thing about these is, because they've got a wing attached, they'll actually fly further. You can carry a bigger payload with a wing than you can with just a parachute. So they'll go further. And gliding, of course, gliding, what happens with gliding is, you go down, you go downwards like this, and the downwards motion um, pushes the wing, and the way, the, wing, the way a wing works is with the air rushing over the top of it, it gives you lift, um, the pressure difference between the top and the bottom. So gliding, there we go, like that. And that's, that's gliding. The bigger you are, the easier, thank you, the easier it is to glide. Um, small things find it very hard to glide because the air is, uh, it's physics, but the air is stickier for smaller things. And that's the easiest way to explain it without, it's called the Reynolds number, you can look it up if you really want to know. Um, so different types of flying. And then you've got powered flight, of course. Then you've got aircraft like, like the plane I flew in on uh, last night, which is using a, a jet engine, and it's converting this hydrocarbon into, in, in, into force, which is pushing you along, um, which is pushing the air over the wings, which provides lift, and so on. And then different control surfaces, just like, just like a bee. So I want to look at powered flight now. I want to look at the bee's flight. Um, as I said, bees have got elbows. Uh, sorry, chickens have got elbows. Birds have got elbows. Um, bats have got elbows too. Um, but bees don't have elbows. Um, and so when, when you swim, what you do is you make your arms as big as possible when you do this, and then as small as possible when you bring them up. As big as possible, as small as possible. Or if you can take them out of the water, even better, because, but you can't take them out of the air if you're flying. 
you can take them out of the fluid water. But if you, keep, if you have to keep you in the body, then you can be as big as possible to push you forward as small as possible. But, but bees can't belt their elbows, so how the hell do they do this? Well, what they do, uh, yes, sorry, I'm going to show you this one. This is a seagull. It's just really nice, isn't it? Um, gliding gently there and flapping a little bit, but typically gliding. If there is hot air rising, they can glide and be lifted on hot air that's rising, but that's, that's a, a whole different thing. That's, uh, using thermals is a whole different thing. What the bee does um, when it flies... Oh, yes, I wanted to show you this. Here is a pigeon flying from uh, Alexander, David Alexander. Um, I'll show you that book later. Um, what you can see is, as it flies at the downstroke, you can see the wing is extended. It's making as big as possible. As big as possible, you can see here. On the upstroke, it makes it as small as possible. So make it small, make it big. Make it small, make it big. Make it small, make it big, like this. And this is really important. And that allows the bird to, to other way. If it was just doing this, it wouldn't go up, it would go up, down, up, down, wouldn't it? Wouldn't go anywhere. So it has to learn something. But bees can't do that. So what do they do? OK, you're, I've, 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 play, I've, I've trailed this long enough. I better tell you, I suppose. Um, so what they do is this really clever thing. And this is why I, want, I said you should come to the front, because you see this better in the front. These are election posters. I love elections. I also make um, emergency hive roofs out of, uh, out of election posters as well. Um, <laughs> All sorts of things, and crown boards. And, and so. Anyway, I digress. Um, so, these, uh, so these are the wings. This is obviously a pair of wings that's acting as one wing. One wing, two wings. And supposed to, because uh, we're in flight, we're not in the hive. And what you can see here is, now, the bee is pushing down, and that's giving lift, and that's the up arrow. Give me lots of lift. Lift me up. Because lift, it's really, it's harder to go up than it is to go along. And so you need a big lot of effort to give me lift. So give me lift. So the bee does this. But now it's got a problem because the wing is at the bottom and it hasn't got elbows. So what the bee does is, remember this now on this wing, this is the, fr this is the bottom of the wing, okay? The bit that says vote somebody, okay? And this is the top. This is the bottom of the wing. This is the bit that's pushing into the wind. When it gets to the bottom, what it does is it turns the wing around and lifts it this way. So lift me up, push me forward. Lift me up, push me forward. Lift me up, push me forward. Lift me up. So it's getting lift on the upstroke, which is very clever, which bees can do, birds can't do, except one bird. Exactly, an honorary insect, as they call it in, in flight circles. The, yeah, an honorary insect, the honeybird. Um, incidentally, kestrels and so on, kestrels, they're the raptors that do this. They're not hovering. Oh, sorry, they can hover for very short periods, um, but in practice, they're flying into the wind very slowly. Their, their speed over the ground is zero, but the speed, their airspeed is typically not zero. Um, um, one of the other things is, Hovering is easier if you're small. Like gliding is easier if you're bigger. If you double the body length, you square the wing area, don't you? But you cube the mass because my mass is width, weight, height times width times length. Yes? And so the bigger you are, the harder it is to fly, and particularly the harder it is to hover, the more. Um, and so that's why smaller things tend to be doing the hovering. And small birds can hover for longer. Big birds ho can hardly hover at all. But hummingbirds can hover routinely because they can do this. I've got a picture, actually, of a hummingbird, which I took in Massachusetts some time ago. Oh, yes. So I'm going to come back to the, the hummingbird. This is how the bee then transitions. So how, OK, so they can put the wing on properly. Um, so this is how they fly forward, right? Lift me up, push me forward. Lift me up, push me forward. So I want to just hover now. Well, it's very straightforward. I go, uh, lift me up a bit, 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 lift me up a bit. And I've, obviously, I'm being moved backwards and forwards a little bit here. But that's what's happening. I'm being, and that's what's happening here. I have a video of my own here, which I hope is going to play now. Yes, this is on a plant. Anybody know what the plant is? 
hibiscus, thank you, in Crete, actually. And you can see her, you can see the wings. The, they're not flapping up and down, they're doing this. They're going side to side. And this, yeah, and we move on. Yes, here's hovering. There is a, there is a hummingbird, and you can see, I hope you can see, she's doing this she or he, uh, as it comes to the nectar. And this comes from, um, this actually comes from, this is, a, a moth, this is a moth, and that is a bird, that is a hummingbird, and again, they're doing this figure of eight, getting lift from both sides of the wing. So you haven't got a top and a bottom in this case, you're doing both. And so the bees had learned on the, in, in zero gravity to, to just to not push themselves up too much, but just push themselves forward if they wanted to go anywhere, which is incredible. And push themselves down if they needed to as well. Otherwise, they'd be smacked against the roof, which is, I don't know, astonishing. I do wish they had HD video of it because it would be, it would be wonderful to see, but I don't suppose they had HD video, or certainly on little cameras in those days. Now, there's two things that deliver um, uh, the power of the wings, just same as if you're running. One is frequency, like, you know, your, your, your cadence, your gait. And the other one is amplitude, how big your steps are. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with the wings. We've talked about the, spe the, wee the, sp the speed of the wings, right? 200, 250 times a second. That doesn't vary much. What does vary is if they've got a big load on, they flap higher. Um, they flap, they, 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 they bigger steps, if you like. I can translate it into that. Now, so. So they understood, so, so they, 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 they've started to understand that the bee gets lift on the upstroke. So they put that into the model. Damn, it still didn't explain it. So they went back. They went back again and they said, okay, how do these insects get the extra lift? And they started some things. Here are some things. One thing is called clap and fling. Um, it's one, something that pigeons do it actually, not to get lift, but just to alert, as, as, a, as an alert. If you disturb a load of pigeons, they go, they make a hell of a noise, don't they, when they fly off. And they're doing this, right? Not to get lift, but to, uh, you know, because to tell the other pigeons, because they're not the brightest, are they? Um, to tell the other pigeons to get the hell away. Um, and what you can see here is they stick the wings together, and then as they pull them apart, they get a lot of lift in that vacuum there, okay? So that low pressure, they get a lot of lift, and they roll it down like that. Fruit flies do this. Unfortunately, bees don't do it, so it doesn't explain, it doesn't help us explain. So the next thing then is, there's this thing called stall, right? If I take my, my toy airplane, which is here, if I, fl if, if I fly it like this, it'll fly along. If I try and fly it too steep, it will stall. That means that the force forward isn't enough, isn't, the, the, isn't enough to give it lift and it'll fall out of the sky. It's not the same as your car stalling. It's a lot more dramatic and serious, and uh, you're screwed if, you're, if, if the aircraft you're in stalls. You really don't want that. It's, uh, that's the sort of thing that happens. And it's not good. Now, you don't want to stall. You really don't want to stall. But I think I've got a picture on this. Um, there's a lot of distortion. This is vortices. This is, you know, if you've ever been in a small aircraft, small aircraft can't, this is, the, this is uh, just a bit of smoke to, to, to show the vortex, but it's a very small aircraft that's coming to land. It's given this big, huge whirlwind, which is a bit like a bow wave on a boat. Get again, another fluid. The, 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 the water is a really good. Um, if you've swum, it, you, you leave a wake behind you, and a boat leaves a bow wake, a whole load of wake but from where it's been. The same way, vortices are these sort of waves, if you like, and there are a whole lot of them from aircraft. Lots of different ones. And if you've ever been in a small aircraft, you, you might know that um, a big aircraft uh, makes so much, so much mess in the air, you can't see it, that if you try and land a small aircraft straight after a big one, it'll flip up probably, because it, the, the air is so turbulent. It takes a long time to clear. But um, the, uh, the, the, let me see, what's this next slide? Um, the way delayed stall works so it uses some of these forces. Essentially, the way it works is I'm, I'm flapping my wings and I'm getting, getting all my lift. And at the bottom here, I'm turning. But what I do is, so I, I'm at, I've got an angle of attack about like this, which is fine. That's not going to stall. But if my angle of attack was like this, I would stall, wouldn't I? No, I'd just be going backwards. I wouldn't, it wouldn't give me lift. So what it does is it goes down. And just at the end, she leaves the angle of attack 
She increases the angle of attack and keeps flapping, which gives you tons of lift. Now, if you keep doing it, you stall, you fall out the sky. So not good. But if you just do it for a very short time, you get a ton of lift and then you pull back. And likewise, at the top here, you pull back and you start with a very high angle of attack, very high like this, and you're getting loads of lift. You might stall, but quickly you get out of that and you go down like this. And you add that in, and that gives you loads of extra lift. And of course, you're doing that 200 times a second. Now, talking of 200 times a second, one of the things is that you will remember that ducks fly, geese, geese fly, they, the one goes in the front and the other one goes behind because what happens is the one in the front flaps the wings and that disturbs the air, there's the vortices again, and the one behind rides that wave. As the, well, as the air comes up behind it, it lifts it, yeah? And the one behind then gets extra lift and doesn't have to push down so hard because he's riding on the wave behind. That's handy for geese and that's why they fly in a V. If you're flapping your wings at 200 times a second, you can ride your own wake. That's quite astonishing, isn't it? Catch your, own, catch your own wake. Let's catch their own waves, like surfing their own, yeah, they are their own waves to surf. So anyway, that, when you add that in, you can finally explain how bees, mathematically, you can then say, okay, well, something of this mass and this, with this wing beat frequency and this amplitude and so on and so forth, and this wing area, the damn things can fly. Thank goodness for that. We've now, <laughs> we've satisfied some scientists that we found a way to prove it. There's still a lot more to learn, and which is why DARPA is, is doing a lot of, lot of experiments. When they land, what they tend to do is they sm slow down to hover, they align their body with, with whatever landing board they're landing on, and then they'll grab out with their front feet, touch it with their antennae, and typically then grab on, grab on with whatever's the closest. Um, yeah, so that's that. Um, I'm just about done. I wanted to give you some references. Um, there are, I think, three outstanding, three books that I found outstandingly useful. First one is Dr. Goodman's Form and Function of Honeybee. Is that back in print, anybody know? It is, yeah. It is. It's an excellent book. Um, she died before, before she finished it. She's in Cardiff University. She, um, it's a beautiful work of science as well as art. I would, I would recommend that. Um, the second one is David Alexander's book, Nature's Flyers, which is surprisingly readable. Um, well, at least some of it is, most of it is. Um, and nature's flyers, it's about birds and bees. Bats, incidentally, they have elbows, don't they? But whereas birds have feathers, and it's the feathers that give you the structure, where bats get their structure, the, the, their, their, their sail, if they were to bend their elbows, their wings would collapse entirely because they're only, it's only a membrane stretched between the arms. And as a result, they, don't, they can't really bend their elbows, otherwise they'd fall out the sky. So, so they only, they have to do some, they have to get lift on the upstroke as well. They do, they, they do something in between birds and insects. There's some, some quite clever stuff there. Um, and finally, John Brackenbury's book here um, on insects in flight has some lovely pictures in it and some more about dragonflies and more about insects. But I think these two are the ones if you really want to know about flight. I'd also say on YouTube, there are some wonderful slow-mo videos of bees taking off um, and where you can actually see the wing beats doing this. They're really very beautiful and uh, worth, worth a look. Um, just look for slow-mo B videos. Um, they're, they're, they're super. Right, that uh, concludes my lecture. Thank you very much indeed. I seem to think that Dr. Robert Picard was involved with those bees that In NASA Cardiff. took up. And he was given a talk and came back with a comment that bees did not fly. And he had to explain why they were not flying. So I'm very surprised to say, hear you say that they did fly in space. Uh, well, I, I, yeah, the NASA thing is fairly, you know, it's in, it's in writing and it's, uh, it's in the NASA flight report. Maybe they were lying, but that's what they said. I can't, uh, I can't, I can't, I wouldn't, Dr. Pickard obviously is a very eminent person, but uh, it's what they wrote and you can read it, you know, you can read it on NASA's website. At the same time, I don't think the astronauts would have a good reason to lie about it, and I don't think Dr. Pickard was there and they were, so, you know, uh, I, 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 would, I would tend to side with them, uh, given that it's at least second person evidence of, that something did happen. Uh, is it true that um, honeybees have a certain number of wing strokes due to their muscles, the sort of the biology of their muscles, or is that...? I have never heard such a thing. Um, it doesn't, forgive me, but it doesn't sound uh, like that would be the determining factor, that it's a certain number of wing beats. 
I suspect that like a car, it's not the number of miles you travel. It depends on how you do it and how much sort of load you're carrying and how much stop and starting and taking off and landing. It, it wouldn't necessarily make the greatest sense to me, but, um, but I, there's a lot we can learn. And if you have the reference, I'd love to see it because I'd build it into the lecture. Have you researched uh, close species like hornets and wasps? Obviously, um, they're interesting, um, maybe as predators uh, being heavier and not so fluffy, maybe they have competitive advantage, but uh, compared to bees, uh, can you say about them? I, my understanding is that they're, sim they're, they're better flyers because they're, not, they're more fighting aircraft than transport aircraft. So they have to have a, um, they haven't, um, they've made a, uh, from a, from a, uh, their, their evolutionary strategy is around fighting and, uh, and, and defense and, and aggression is an important part of it. They're probably obviously carnivorous and therefore they have to be able to catch things and therefore they have to be better fighter aircraft. But they don't have to be such good uh, freighter aircraft, cargo aircraft. And therefore, they're built to do. Oh, they say they're built. That's how they've evolved to have advantages in some in some ways and disadvantages in others. That's to the best of my knowledge. But I'm not no expert on hornets. Finally, sir. Yes. Yes. Um, your diagram clearly showed how the indirect flight muscles are used to yes uh, flex the the thorax and hence flap the wings. Mm. Can you explain how the indirect flight muscles are are used? Uh, to achieve uh, body heat, ah, yeah. uh, rather than uh, wing, wing beats. Yeah, so my understanding is that what they do is uh, in order to keep warm in the winter, they, uh, they pop the clutch and run the engine, essentially. Um, and I know that's rather glib, but so what they do is they fold the wings and they, 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 so they disconnect the flight muscles from the wings and then they run these flight muscles in order to generate heat, uh, which, is, which is in, in the cluster. Um, I don't exactly know the mechanics of how they managed to pop the clutch. But, yes, but, the, but yes, that's right. That, that's what they should do. And I, should have, I, should, I could mention that in the lecture. It would be a good one to add in. Yeah. Are pollen loads the shape they are in order to act as aerofoils? Pollen? Pollen loads. On the, their pollen on their legs, he's talking about. Uh, act as aerofoils? Yeah. That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know if it makes much of a difference flying at that sort of speed. But I, I, yes, it's a good question. There's a PhD in that, I should think, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> Not for me or you, I suggest, but to somebody. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I want to stand up and say this, but I'm suffering from memory loss. Um, I did module five, and at some point I remember reading that the muscles can't reach the frequency required, and there's a resonance effect that manages to increase the frequency. Is that right? Now, where I... This, <laughs> the speaker behind me got me going, and I thought, yes, there's something I can't remember, and I wish I could remember what the reference was. Um, I thought I'd read it in Leslie Goodman, but I might be wrong. I don't remember reading it in Goodman, um, and I do remember reading that. But then again, yes. <sighs> yes, so thank you. If you find it, let me know. Yeah, there is, a, as I say, there's a lot about flight that we don't know. And it's one of these subjects that doesn't really affect, you know, coming to this lecture isn't going to improve your yield or um, make you, a, you know, a happier beekeeper, you know, and less, get less stings, unfortunately. So there's no economic incentive, and therefore we don't tend to, flight is, you know, it's great fun and everything, but it, you know, it doesn't tend to get the treatment that, it, that I think it deserves in terms of the, uh, the attention. Yeah. When I'm collecting bees that have got into my kitchen, I use a tumbler and just put it over them and... Use a what? I use a, a glass tumbler yeah. and, and just pop it over them and then slip a postcard underneath to capture them and, and then out the door they go. Uh, they tend to hop up into the glass. If they don't do that, I get a leg off, but they usually cooperate. Um, now, I can do that with bees, but uh, common houseflies beat me every time. Does, <laughs> is, that, is that a higher flicker fusion rate that means... The, I think the difference with the key difference with the, with the house flies is they have these gyroscopes on the side of their heads, don't they? That, um, and that allow them to be more acrobatic. Um, and again, evolutionary house flies, uh, flies have to be more acrobatic because they're being swatted, whereas bees don't tend to land on cows and humans and things that would swat them. They tend to land on flowers that don't tend to, you know. Re exactly, <laughs> react adversely. So, so I, they don't think they 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 haven't developed that that those wonderful flying skills that that, that house flies have. 
Um, the ability to take off backwards and um, you know tumble through the air and right yourself and then and take a whack and get up and fly off and all those kind of things that house flies can do which which annoy the hell out of me as well but and I, I don't believe it's about vision I believe it's about the speed of response and they've evolved to be to be to be more wary of uh, view with your tumbler or your or your newspaper or whatever it is you're going at them with I was wondering how do they cool down when they are flying so they they cool down um, if we go back to this if we can get this wing this one to play they they uh, they breathe he like 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 if this is going to play for me yes they breathe heavily like this um, which which expels the air which takes hot air out and cold air in so that will do it of course they don't sweat because they haven't got pores like us um, when they're flying through the air the rushing this the air um, the the the, the hemolymph travels round their body and acts like a radiator so it cools as it as the uh, the onrushing air cools the hemolymph which which cools down the bee um, and then of course they can breathe to expel hot air and put in white that's my understanding is and i think if you had them uh, flying fast in zero wind if you see what i mean if you were if they were tethered onto a stick and uh, and flying very fast and the air wasn't moving around them, I think they'd overheat. Just like a car would if it wasn't moving and didn't have a radiator fan. So I'm, I'm interested in issues about scale here. If you had a yeah. bee that was the size of, I don't know, a car, would, would the physics sort of break down in terms of like relative weights and size and stuff? Yeah, so as I say, if you double your, if you double your, your length, you, you, you Q, you square, Right? So if I go from you know, uh, two meters to four meters, I, my, my, uh, my wing area, well, I might go then from three meters to nine meters, square meters of wing area. But my mass cubes, because, and therefore the bigger you are, the harder it is to fly. So with, with, but, it, but, but because of the Reynolds number and sticky air, the easier it is to glide. So they wouldn't, if they were, if they were as big as, if a bee was as big as me, it wouldn't fly as it does. It would probably fly more like an albatross. Uh, okay, because why, why? But it would need elbows. Why, why were insects? Why, do, why were insects able to fly bigger in like, like prehistoric times? Well, of course, you get big butterflies in the tropics. But uh, how big were the insects in prehistoric times? Uh, I'm just thinking like mad, huge. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think they were like... as big as as big as seagulls. But I, I could be wrong. They, you're, li you're limited by the amount of oxygen in the air, aren't you? you? You're limited by oxygen. Insects, obviously, the other thing about insects is when you're small, you can pipe the oxygen direct to the muscles, as John says, um, which means you don't need hemolymph. You don't need, sorry, you don't need red blood cells to go. You don't need lungs. And so insects don't have lungs. They pipe them direct, the, the air direct in. That doesn't work if you're big. It only works if you're small. If you're very small, you don't even need the tubes. You can just absorb it if you're like a little... Uh, a uh, single cell thing, you just absorb oxygen, as I understand it, from, from, from your environment. And so, so there's a number of things that would make it hard if you were. The other thing, of course, is that possibly the, the strength of the materials, um, they may not scale in the same way. Yeah. Interesting question. Interesting. But also, uh, in prehistoric times, they actually had more oxygen in the air. More oxygen, that's now. right. It was much richer so, in oxygen. So you wasn't actually it? had bigger insects then. Because they, because they, because the fuel was better. Correct. Yeah, because yeah, sure, because you could get more out of your, yeah, yeah higher quality, high, higher octane fuel. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, I understand from the anatomy books that there are these um, axillary sclerites which um, do the pitch and roll in your. Yeah. What are, what is the function of the the basal air and the subal air? It's something that I haven't quite understood. I know I can't remember. <laughs> is the <a> simple answer. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, it would be a lecture in itself, is how all that works. Okay. And uh, there's so much ground to cover in a lecture like this, mm. uh, unfortunately, that it's broad rather than deep. But I think for an anatomy lecture, if you, if, uh, if you really wanted to get into that, how, how all this stuff works, and as you say, how the, how the, how the direct mu flight muscles trim the flight, chain, change the pitch and change the roll, and, 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 and how the, the, all of that stuff. Is a, is a hugely complex topic. And I don't think it's a very easy one to give, actually, in a lecture. 
I think it's, it's and that's one of the reasons I shied away from getting into the detail of it, to be honest.